It's the finale of the Big Money Buzz Show, and Natalie is faced with a difficult task. There are three fish bowls, each of them containing a different amount of gold bars inside. If she manages to put her hand inside one of the bowls and take it out, she can keep the gold bar. The first bowl has scalding hot water inside of it. The second is filled with flesh-burning acid. And the last bowl has a couple of venomous scorpions walking around. Which bowl should you choose? Natalie should just wait until the water cools down and grab the gold bar from the first bowl. Bob was blindfolded and put into a shaky van. When he woke up, he was alone in a dark, empty room. There was nobody there, but there were three envelopes on the floor. A post-it on top of the envelope said, Each envelope contains a red capsule and two statements. In one of these envelopes, both statements are false. In another envelope, both statements are true. You have to choose the correct capsule to get out of this alive. He opened the first envelope, saw a capsule and the messages, 1. Don't take this pill. 2. Take the pill from the second envelope. On the second envelope, the note said, 1. Don't take the pill from the first envelope. 2. Take the pill from the third envelope. And the last envelope said, 1. Don't take this pill. 2. Take the pill from the first envelope. Well, which capsule should Bob take? He should trust the pill from the third envelope. Let's see why. The first message of the first envelope is true, while the second is false. Both messages from the second envelope are true. This leaves us with two false statements on the third envelope. Timothy and Diana were strolling in a magic forest together when they ran into an evil witch. The witch captured Diana and took her to a haunted castle. Timothy managed to find the hidden castle and watched as the witch turned Diana into a frog. When the witch left the room, he snuck inside to turn Diana back into human form. He found a spell book that could help him and found out the recipe for the magic potion he had to make. He recognized most of the ingredients, but the last two were encrypted. Take a look at the witch's ingredient cabinet and try to help Timothy discover the last two ingredients he needs to make the magic potion. You got it! That's exactly what he needs! The day started busy in Faber Town. The police station got a call saying an undercover vampire was passing as a teacher at Middle Moon Elementary School. The officer went down there to check and found three possible suspects. Take a look at them and see if you can guess who the vampire is. It's the one in the middle. She's wearing sunglasses inside the cafeteria and drinking a very suspicious red drink. Yikes! Eric was coming home from a night out. As he reached the gate of his apartment, he heard the sound of someone bawling. He looked around, but no one was there. That's when he noticed something that scared him, and he shouted, Ghosts! Ghosts! Someone help me! Look at the image. Can you identify what Eric saw that scared him so much? The gate lamp isn't attached to the pole. It's floating in the air and somehow still shining bright. Well, this isn't right. Then Eric called his best friend, who also happened to be a renowned ghost hunter. That's convenient. His buddy Ray arrives, and his ghost watch immediately starts beeping. It leads them to the building's pool. At the pool, they see a girl swimming. Eric shouts, Hey, why are you swimming in the pool so late at night? Here, let me help you get out. But Ray stops him, saying, Don't do that! Why did Ray do it? Look at the pool. The girl is swimming, but there is no movement in the water. She must be a ghost. 
On the other side of town, Bobby is also ghost hunting. He called his friend Susan to visit the town's old creepy hotel and bust some ghosts. As they arrive, they find clear signs of ghost activity. It looked like that ghost had a sense of humor, though, and wanted to play hide-and-seek with them. The ghost led Bobby and Susan into a room with four doors. Each door had an inscription on it with clues to where the ghost might be hiding. The sign on door A says, it's behind B or C. The sign behind door B says, it's behind A or D. Door C says, it's in here. And door D claims, the ghost isn't here. Bobby and Susan looked very confused until a note appeared next to their feet saying, three of the inscriptions are false and one is true. Can you guess which door led to the ghost? Let's see how this would work. If the ghost was behind door A, then both B and D would be true. But if it was behind door B, then both A and D would be true. If the ghost was behind door C, then A, C, and D are all true. But if the ghost was behind door D, then the statements on all the other doors were false, except for that on door B. This matched the rules, so it was behind door D. To get into the best Halloween party in town, Becky had to solve a difficult riddle. There were two hourglasses in front of her. One hourglass measures 7 minutes, and the other measures 4 minutes. She needed to time 9 minutes using both hourglasses. How could you do it? First, she turned both hourglasses at the same time. By the time the 4-minute glass finished, there were still 3 minutes left on the other one. She flipped the 4-minute glass again. By the time the 7-minute glass was empty, there was 1 minute left on the other glass. And by the time the 4-minute glass emptied again, there was 1 minute's worth of sand in the bottom half of the 7-minute timer. She flipped it over again, so there's 1 minute's worth of sand on the top of the glass. And when the 7-minute timer finally emptied again, 9 minutes elapsed in total. Whew, that took some work. Jessica was on a trip to the desert when she got separated from her group. She noticed a sandstorm was coming her way. She had three options for what to do. She could try to run away from the sandstorm, she could hide behind a big rock, or she could try hiding in the desert's dry riverbed. Which one is Jessica's best option? Well, the first option is a terrible idea, as she will never run faster than a sandstorm. The riverbed is also not such a good idea, as it's too low and the sand from the storm can fill the entire hole in no time. Her best option would be to hide behind a big rock. After the storm passed, Jessica used the radio to send an SOS signal to the guide. The guide told her to sit tight. A rescue team would shortly be on its way to help her. In a few hours, three rescue teams came to help Jessica. She got suspicious and asked all the teams who had sent them. The first team said that they had heard the news on the radio that a woman was lost in the desert and came quickly to aid her. The second team said that the hotel she was staying in called the police for help. The last team said they received a radio call saying a woman was in distress and quickly came to help. Which rescue team should she trust? the last team. Jessica sent a message to her guide as soon as the storm was over, remember? Detective Brightbrain was sitting in his office when his phone rang. Richard Brooks, a jeweler, said he had just been robbed. Brightbrain arrived immediately at the boutique, and Mr. Brooks explained what happened. I spent the entire morning showing diamond rings to a gentleman in a gray suit. He was extremely polite and knew a lot about diamonds. When I looked down to grab the store's most expensive ring, I felt someone hit me on the head. I fell forward, and when I woke up, the guy was gone. 
Brightbrain didn't ask any more questions. Instead, he wrote a report saying Mr. Brooks wasn't robbed. He was actually faking the whole thing. Take a look at the scene. How did Brightbrain come to that conclusion? If Mr. Brooks fell forward, the weight of his body would have broken the glass counter in front of him. And look, there's not even a scratch. The next day, Brightbrain was driving to work when he got hit by a red Chevrolet. The guy got away pretty fast, but the detective managed to see the car's license plate began with 6-2. Back at the office, Brightbrain tracked down the possible owner of the vehicle, Mr. Neander. The detective arrived at Mr. Neander's house together with the police and immediately saw a red Chevrolet with a 6-2 license plate in the yard. But there weren't any signs of a collision. Brightbrain interrogated the subject, but Mr. Neander said, I swear it wasn't me. I haven't left the house in two days, and I can't use my car because I lost the keys a week ago. Brightbrain approached the vehicle and leaned on the hood of the car to peep inside. He immediately said, I know you're lying. How was Brightbrain so sure? The detective tried the simplest way to detect whether a car had been recently used. He checked the temperature of the motor. As the hood was still warm, this showed that Mr. Neander was lying. During the month of December, a gang of robbers was operating in Bentonville. They walked dressed up as Santa Claus and broke into houses through chimneys. They put valuable goods into their Santa bags and walked straight out the door. When the neighbors saw them, they thought they were the real Santa. Finally, the police caught the entire gang. However, one of them claimed he was the real Santa and shouldn't be convicted for crimes he didn't commit. Detective Brightbrain was called to handle the case because he had seen the real Santa once when he was still a little child. He recalled that Santa was medium height. He was wearing a coat with six buttons and there was a pocket on the right. He also said that Santa's belt buckle was square. Take a look at the footage from the police station. Can you figure out who the real Santa is? It's the second one on the right. He fits all of Brightbrain's descriptions. It was raining when Brightbrain decided to drive down to the gym. Halfway there, a woman stopped his car asking for help. She said someone had just bumped into her car and drove away. When the detective took a look around, the only person next to the place of the incident was a man fixing his tire. The lady said that that was the car that bumped into hers. But when Brightbrain went to talk to the man, he said it couldn't be true because he was busy fixing his car the whole time. Can you tell who's lying? It's the guy fixing his car. The rain just recently started, which means that if he was fixing his car the whole time, the ground underneath it would have been dry. But look, it's wet. This means he's just arrived there and was actually the one responsible for the incident. The next day, Brightbrain left his girlfriend's house directly to his office building. He was late for work, so he ignored several stop signs along the way. A police car passed by him exactly at the moment he was turning the wrong way onto a one-way street, but the officers didn't arrest him. Why? Because the detective was walking, not driving a car. Duh! Around 8 in the morning the next day, Detective Brightbrain was on his way to get coffee when he saw a robbery happen. A masked person ran off with a woman's wallet. The detective ran after the thief and saw him entering a coffee shop. When Brightbrain went inside, he searched for the thief but couldn't find them. The person had taken their mask off. He told the coffee shop owner that one of their clients was a thief, and the owner closed down the shop so that the detective could question the people there. The first person he interrogated was Allie. 
She said she had been in the coffee shop for the last three hours, working on her laptop. Brian said he had just come inside to get an espresso to go. Catherine said she had just started eating her breakfast and didn't see anything suspicious going on. Lastly, he interrogated John, the coffee shop owner. He said he opened the shop at 7 a.m. and hadn't left the place since then. Bright Brain knew immediately who had done it. Can you guess who it was? It was Allie. She said she'd been in the shop for the past three hours, but the shop had just opened at 7 o'clock. At his office, Bright Brain received a strange text message from his workmate, Harry. The text said, Zucchini is in the fridge. Otherwise, I'm fine. Okay? The weird text made the detective think there was a message hidden inside. After a few minutes, he found a hidden word in the message. Can you guess what it was? If you pay attention closely, the first letter of each line can be mixed together to form the word zoo. Quickly, Bright Brain grabbed his things and drove to the local zoo. He arrived at the zoo and immediately saw the entrance to a secret passageway. The passageway led him to a network of underground tunnels. At the entrance to the first tunnel, there were venomous rats. At the entrance to the second tunnel, there was an explosive about to go off in five minutes. And at the entrance to the last tunnel, there was toxic gas. Which tunnel should he choose? The second one, of course. He can pass through the tunnel after the explosive goes off. At the end of the tunnel, he found himself in a dark room. As soon as he entered, the door locked behind him and he was stuck. The room was empty except for another door at the other end of the room. That door was sealed with a letter combination lock. There was a slip of paper with the following hint written on it. P plus 3, N minus 1, B minus 1. N plus 4, S plus 1. What's the code word? It took Bright Brain a while to figure it out, but he was able to crack the code. The code word was SMART. The key to this riddle was hidden in the alphabet. P plus its three following letters is S. N minus one letter is M, and so on. Phew, the door opened and led him to another room where he finally met Harry. Bright Brain untied his workmate and told him he was going to get them out of that situation. But when he looked around, he noticed they were standing at the bottom of a very deep well. Looking up, they could see the clear blue sky, but it looked like there was no way out. The detective felt soil falling onto their heads and he feared they were going to be buried in mud. Luckily, in an hour, both men made it out of the well alive. How did they manage to get out? They managed to tamp down the soil that was falling into the well. This way, they would get closer and closer to the surface until they managed to jump out and run away. That's it for Bright Brain's adventure today. That was a lot. I know something that will wake your brain up better and faster than coffee. Yep, it's time to find your magnifying glass. Oh my God. Look at this picture attentively. What's wrong here? Each of these four people has a slice of pizza in their hands, but only three pieces are missing from the pizza box. You have three jars that are all mislabeled. One jar contains apples, another contains oranges, and the third jar contains a mixture of both apples and oranges. Mm. You are allowed to pick as many fruits as you want from each jar to fix the labels on them. What is the minimum number of fruits that you have to pick and from which jars to correctly label them? Yeah. 
Let's look at this scenario. You pick a fruit from the jar labeled apples and oranges, and you get an apple. That means that the jar should be labeled apples. Now, the jar labeled oranges has to be labeled apples and oranges. As it can't contain oranges, and we've already got the apples jar, a similar scenario applies if it's an orange you take out of the jar labeled apples and oranges. So, you just need to take one fruit from the jar, apples and oranges, to label all the jars correctly. A farmer once challenged an engineer, a physicist, and a mathematician to fence off the largest amount of area using the least amount of fence. Hmm. The engineer shaped his fence like a large circle and said it was the most efficient way. The physicist made a long line and said that fencing off half of Earth was the best. The mathematician laughed at them and showed his design, <laughs> which beat the others. What did he do? The mathematician made a small circular fence around himself and declared himself to be on the outside. Every day after work, Jack arrived at the train station at 5 p.m. His wife left home in her car to meet him there at exactly 5 p.m., picked him up and drove him home. One day, Jack got to the station an hour early and started walking home. He was walking until his wife picked him up along the way. They got home 30 minutes earlier than usual. How long was he walking? The best way to think about this problem is to consider it from the perspective of the wife. Her round trip was decreased by 30 minutes, which means each leg of her trip was decreased by 15 minutes. It means that Jack must have been walking for 45 minutes. Logan is a special agent who's trying to catch a notorious villain. After long months of investigation, he finds the criminal's headquarters. But the door is locked, which is not a surprise, really. Logan sees a screen next to the entrance. He touches it, and the display lights up. Hmm, it must be a riddle. And our special agent needs to solve it to get inside. Add one line to make it right. 9.50 equals I-O-I-O-I-O. Logan cracks the puzzle in no time. What's the answer? Nine point five zero equals I O T O I O. Oh, yeah. The door opens and the man steps into a dark corridor. After walking for some time, Logan notices another door. Ah, a code lock again. The man also spots a calendar hanging on the wall. At the bottom, there are several letters, M, F, W. After connecting the dots, the special agent figures out the code. What is it? It's 153. The letters stand for the days of the week, Monday, Friday, and Wednesday. Monday is the first day, Friday is the fifth, and Wednesday is the third one. Look at these two families. Which one is fake? What do you think? Well, the family on the right has weird dietary habits. They allow their son to eat the whole cake on his own. But maybe they just don't care about healthy eating. The family on the left, though, seems to be perfectly fine. But have you spotted a USB port covered by the necklace the mother of the family is wearing? She's a robot and all this family thing is just a joke. Now, look at these prisoners. Who is more likely to escape? Huh, gotcha. Neither of them. The one on the right will be stopped by the prison guard, while the one on the left will end up face to face with these pretty unfriendly dogs. How about these girls? Which one lacks common sense? <laughs> that was another tricky question. Both of them aren't the brightest bulbs in the chandelier. The one on the left is going to post a photo of her credit card on her social media. 
and the one on the right is going to share the details of her ID and plane ticket with her followers. That's incredibly unsafe. It was the first day of school when the principal's wallet went missing. There were three suspects, the gardener, the math teacher, and the coach. Here's what they said. The gardener was mowing the front lawn, the math teacher was checking the surprise test he'd given his students, and the coach was meeting new people who wanted to join the school's soccer team. Who took the wallet? It was the math teacher. No one gives surprise tests on the first day of school. Look at these women. Can you figure out which one isn't pregnant? It's the woman on the right. Her belly is strangely shaped, and something seems to be moving under her clothes. Ugh, creepy. One day, the emperor asked his general what he should choose if he was offered either justice or a lot of gold. I'd choose the gold. The general answered without hesitation. The emperor was taken aback. Oh. I would have been disappointed even if this was the choice of a servant, the emperor said. But coming from you, it's not only disappointing but also shocking and sad. But the general justified his answer to the enraged and hurt emperor without a problem. What did he say? He said that people asked for what they didn't have. Under your majesty's rule, he then added, justice is available to everybody, but I am a spendthrift and always short of money. That's why I said I would choose the gold. The answer pleased the emperor, and his respect for the general was restored. The police arrived at a ski resort early in the morning. At night, someone attacked the manager of the hotel, and he was taken to a hospital, still unconscious. The police suspected three people, Laura, James, and Arthur, who had arrived the day before. The officers inspected their rooms, and here's what they found. Look at these things attentively and try to understand who attacked the manager. It was Arthur. Look, he doesn't have any warm clothing, which means he didn't come for skiing. Allison is a big boss in an international company. One day, she's hurrying to an important meeting when she notices the documents she needs haven't been printed out. But she's asked at least three of her subordinates to do it. Ian says he's just returned from the supermarket because they've run out of coffee beans. Robert claims he's been terribly busy drafting a new contract. And Alice answers she's been in the kitchen preparing snacks and making coffee for the meeting. Who's actually forgotten about the task and is making up excuses at the last moment? It's Alice. There's no coffee in the office. Then how could she make it? Rich businessman Mr. Hudson had a serious disease and was staying at the best hospital in the city. He was treated with pills invented by a scientist working in that hospital. Mr. Hudson was feeling better and better and was getting ready to be discharged. But then, one morning, he was found in critical condition. The police had four suspects, the cleaner, the businessman's nurse, his assistant, and the scientist. The cleaner said that Mr. Hudson liked when his room was tidy, so she came every day to clean it. The nurse said that she gave Mr. Hudson's injections every morning, and they had even become friends. The scientist was very upset. His disease was complicated, but we've made such progress. And today, this happened. And the assistant answered that her boss asked her to bring his favorite sweets every day. And she did just that. Can you figure out who caused the worsening of Mr. Hudson's condition? It was the nurse. Mr. Hudson was treated with special pills. What injections is she talking about? What? Harrison was walking home when someone threw something at him and knocked the guy out. 
When he came round, he found himself in a room with four doors and a tiny window. Harrison opened the window, but it was too small for him to squeeze through. Suddenly, the guy spotted a piece of paper lying on the floor. It was a note that said, Only one door leads outside. The other three doors don't lead anywhere. You can try to open just one door and only once. If you don't succeed, all of them will be locked forever. Oh. Harrison thought for a while and made the right choice. Yeah. How did he figure out which door was the one he needed? He opened the window. This created a draft. The guy checked the keyholes and felt some cool air coming from one of them. It was the door to freedom. Detective Sheldon Copper was resting at a beach resort when an unpleasant accident happened there. Someone pushed elderly Mrs. Stevenson into the swimming pool when there was no one around. But this someone didn't know the lady was once the best swimmer at her university, and she never stopped practicing. So it wasn't difficult for her to cross the swimming pool and get out of it at the other side. Sheldon asked the lady if she had seen the attacker. She didn't but she was sure it was someone who knew she'd just received a huge inheritance. Hmm. The detective needed to talk to three people. They were Mrs. Stevenson's son, Terry, her granddaughter, Gloria, and her niece, Judy. Terry said, These days, I've been very busy. Something urgent came up at work. I don't even have time to leave my room to go for breakfast or dinner. Hmm. Gloria asked Sheldon to keep her secret. She was seeing a waiter she had met at a beach cafe. If her relatives found out, they would be furious. Ah. And Judy told Sheldon she'd taken a car to go shopping in the city center. Who's lying? (laughs) Terry. The man looks sunburned. But how can it be if he hasn't left his room for days? (laughs) Jaden bought a beautiful ring for his girlfriend. He wanted to propose to her at the weekend. He left the ring on his desk at home and went to work. But when he got back in the evening, he didn't find the ring. Only his three sisters were at home that day, and none of them liked his girlfriend. He went to question each of them. Mia was in her room. She said she'd spent the whole day there painting the walls. Emily was in the kitchen. She answered that she'd been cooking a birthday cake for her friend. And the youngest, Nora, was in the garden. She said she'd been planting roses. It didn't take Jaden long to figure out who had taken the ring. Do you know who it was? It was Nora. She looks too tidy for a person who was supposedly spending the entire day in the garden. Plus, she doesn't have any gardening tools. The best player of Julian's volleyball team disappeared right before the game. Julian's main suspects were three players from the rival team. Jackson said, I've just returned from the gym. I was warming up before the competition. Leo had to pick up his wife and daughter from the hospital, and Ryan claimed he'd fractured his leg, and the team doctor was giving him a massage. Who's behind the player's disappearance? It's Ryan. Getting a massage when your leg is broken? Really? Can you figure out the answer to this rebus riddle? The answer is summary. 